So we're at part two, chapter 17, therapy. And so we're looking at the cognitive behavior therapy with the David Myers 8th edition psychology textbook. So cognitive behavior is cognitive therapists combine um, some of their therapy with some sort of behavior modification. And so cognitive behavior therapy, it aims to alter the way people will act their behavior and then it tries to alter the way they actually think. We look at group therapy as well. Group therapy, you're normally looking at six to nine people, and it's about a 90-minute session, so an hour and a half. And it costs less because there's more people. And so because it's more um, cost efficient, a lot of people do actually go to it. And so clients benefit from knowing each other and having these similar problems with someone else. So sometimes there's comfort in the fact that you're not the only one suffering from this. So like there's group therapy for Alcoholics Anonymous and other groups that exist. Um, and so normally you have a therapist in there, but you have everybody being respectful of everybody being able to talk. And so family therapy is another type of therapy that we look at. And in family therapy, what we see is that we understand that people operate together. It's just like the group therapy. And so if there is something wrong with a member of your family, then you might need to treat the whole family as a unit. So family therapy treats the family as a system. And the therapist pretty much guides the family members towards some sort of positive relationship and improved communication. There are people who go to family therapy that have nothing wrong with their family. They just think that this is a really good time to open up communication lines between them and their kids. So when we look at evaluating therapy, uh, who do people turn to for help with most of their psychological disorders? Most people actually go to their physicians, so their doctors and medical doctors. And this is um, why biomedical therapy is just more prevalent. Other professionals like clergy, about 20%, and then mental health, uh, mental health psychologists, you're looking at almost 40%. So when we evaluate psychotherapies, when you look at the different kinds of psychotherapies that are out there, cognitive is a big portion, and probably part of that is, is that depression is the most common abnormal disorder, and it is normally the disorder that people seek help for. We look at behavioral being 9%, humanistic 11 family systems 20%, and a lot of that has to do with like addiction problems and just the fact that divorce rate is about 50% in America and then psychoanalytical or psychodynamics is still 28%. So is psychotherapy effective? It's really difficult to say whether something is perfect, whether it's helpful, but it all is coming down to whether the person actually sees some improvement. Um, does the therapist feel that the patient has actually improved? Do family and friends feel that the patient has improved? And so when we look at the client's perspe uh, perception, so if you ask clients about their experiences of getting on the therapy, they normally overestimate the value of its effectiveness. And this is why critics of therapy be remain pretty skeptical. You know, of course, if you're paying $200 a week to see your therapist, you're going to want to see results. It's like why people quit diets so fast, you know. You paid all this money to go on Nutrisystem or Weight Watchers, and if you don't see the pounds dropping right away, you kind of quit following your diet. So clients who enter therapy in crisis, um, these clients, sometimes what ends up happening is that the problems just kind of go away over time. I mean, sometimes, you know, you're only depressed right now because school is really rough, but there are times in school when it's pretty easy for you. Clients may need to believe that therapy is worth the effort, and clients generally speak kindly of their therapist. They believe that these people genuinely want to help them. And so when you look at a, um, a clean, uh, clinician's perception, so when you look at the actual therapist. Um, the, what they look at is they think that their patient is better off having the therapy than not having the therapy. And part of that is because, you know, some people, they're just not going to admit that they have failures. Um, there is another argument that um, because you believe that you're helping this person and this person might now have some other sort of abnormal disorder that they developed that at another time that it wasn't you like you cured them of the one abnormal order and then another one pops up another thing is is that therapists um, and therapy regardless of the outcome there's some sort of effect or there's some sort of treatment that actually sticks with the patient and so outcome research, how can we objectively measure the effectiveness of psychotherapy? If we look at meta-analysis of a number of studies, suggests that thousands of patients benefit more from therapy than those who do not go. So people who actually go for abnormal disorders experience some sort of relief. So research shows that treated patients were 80% better than the ones who were left untreated. 
Um, so relative effectiveness of different therapies. This is a pretty good chart for you guys to look at and make sure you memorize for the AP exam because if you do get an essay, they might ask you to um, evaluate like a like Suzy Q and what's wrong with Suzy Q. And so here would be a pretty good therapy chart for you to kind of know. So if you're looking at depression, behavior, cognitive, interpersonal is a pretty good one. Anxiety, cognitive exposure, stress inoculation, bulimia, which is a abnormal disorder. Eating disorders are in the, remember the DSM-4. Cognitive behavior, phobias behavior, bad wedding behavior modification. So evaluating alternate um, therapies, we do have alternate therapies out there. You can see we have the systematic desensitization, you have the therapeutic touch, you have like herbal remedies, um, and then you have like personality typey ones. Line movement desensitization and reprocessing is another therapy, and this is where the therapist tries to unlock and reprocess previous frozen traumatic memories in a person by waving a finger in front of the patient's eyes. Um, there's, this has never held up the scientific testing, but you know, some people that have had it, they think it works. Light exposure therapy is for a seasonal affective disorder, so SAD. This is a mood disorder, and what ends up happening here is that they um, get this fake light, and this fake light is the light exposure, and so it gives them the vitamin D, or it makes their body believe that they're being exposed to the sun, and so it makes them feel happier. So sun tanning boost, stuff like that, even though it's really bad for you, a lot of people do think that it makes them feel better because it mimics light. Um, when you look at things that are common across our psychotherapies, it is really a hope for demoralized people. It does give people a new perspective, and an empathetic, trusting, and caring relationship does develop. When you look at cultures and values, um, psychotherapists may differ from each other and from their clients and their personal backgrounds, values, and cultural backgrounds, but they all want to do well. So a therapist should, um, like if you actually are going to search for a therapist, what you should do is you should look for two or more therapists. Um, and you should go to one, go to another one, figure out which one works best with you because you need to be comfortable in the situation. So if we look at a clinical psychologist, these people actually have a PhD um, and they're experts in the field of research assessment and therapy and they go through a supervised internship. Um, a clinical or psychiatric social worker, they normally have a master's of social work, so they have post-grad stuff. And these social workers work normally with everyday personal and family problems. Counselors, um, these could be like people like in your church or clergy or abuse counselors. Um, they normally have like a bachelor's degree in this stuff and they work with family relationships, spouse, child abuse, their victims, and substance abuser. Psychiatrists have to have, um, or most psychiatrists really do have a medical um, doctorate and they have to have that if they want to prescribe medicine. Now if they don't want to prescribe medicine then they're just going to go for their psychology degree. But for a psychiatrist, they need that medical doctor. They need the MD. Um, now, because of that, they can prescribe medication. So we look at biomedical therapy real quick. We look at drug treatment, surgery, and electric shock therapy. So drug therapy, here what we're looking at um, is the pharmacy industry. And what we see is that more drugs are actually being created, and hospitalization in our mental institutions has really declined. Um, a lot of our homeless population, as I said before, has really um, developed because they do have an abnormal disorder and we're not really prepared to deal with all the illnesses of it. And it's just like with the soldiers coming home from Iraq and Afghanistan with the different disorders and the different um, disabilities that some of them have, the medical institution was just not prepared for them and you know, you didn't realize it until it was too late. And so double-blind procedures have to be used on all medical tests, so all drugs. And so this is when, you know, your researchers and your patients don't know which group they actually have. And normally you have a placebo involved. So there's a fake drug and then a real drug. And then after all the results are tallied, then you figure out whether the drug is appropriate, whether it worked. So when we look at schizophrenia, remember this is back at chapter 16, so we look at inappropriate symptoms like the positive ones, hallucinations, disorganized thinking, diluted away. These are the check plus plus. They got these that other people don't have. When you look at the negative symptoms, this means they're missing these that normal people have. So apathy, expressionless faces, rigid faces. When we look at um, what works for people who are 
Um, schizophrenic, we need an antipsychotic drug, so like Thorazine or Chlorazephine. And what this is, is Thorazine tries to remove the positive symptoms. So it, it's, kind of a set, it's kind of a sedative in a lot of ways, but it reduces their agitation, their delusions, and their hallucinations. So Chlorazephine, what this one does is it tries to take away the negative stuff like apathy, jumbled thoughts, concentration difficulties. Um, and so what both of the drugs do is they basically block on the receptors for your dopamine. And remember, it's an excessive amount of dopamine that actually causes schizophrenics to hallucinate and see things that shouldn't be there. Now, if somebody actually has an anxiety disorder, um, and so we look at an anxiety disorder like OCD, post-traumatic stress disorder, these kind of things, they could take an anti-anxiety drug like Xanax. And what this does is it will depress the central nervous system. It reduces our anxiety and their tension by trying to get GABA, a neural transmitter, elevated in their blood system. And so antidepressants, of course, they're for our, our depressive um, mood disorders, our bipolar disorders. And so common ones are like Prozac, Zoloft, Paxil. And what they try and do is they try and elevate or try and increase your mood by making certain that serotonin is actually taken up and so this is what they're trying to balance out. Um, when you're looking at someone who's bipolar you might want to give them yeah a Prozac, a Zoloft, but you might also want to give them a lithium carbonate and a lithium carbonate is just a common salt and what it does is it stabilizes the bipolar episodes. So it stabilizes their manic episodes because it regulates the norepinephrine and the glucomate neurotransmitters in the person's body. ECT, the electroconvulsive therapy, this is used um, for severely depressed patients um, who aren't responding to drugs. The patient is under the whole time and the patient is given a muscle relaxer and what ends up happening is they do take the electrodes and they put it to the temples of the brain and they give a 100 volt shock. And what they think, you know, there's two reasons why they think this one uh, works. Um, one, it puts the body in so much stress that serotonin is forced to be released throughout the body. So your body's in so much shock that the body actually like restarts. And the other thing is they think it's like a car battery that it shocks your body back in the working. Um, but they're all alternatives to um, ECT therapy, so the transcranial magnetic stimulation. And what this one does is it's pulsating magnetic coils that go around the brain. And what we th um, think is that it treats depression with minimal side effects. Um, with ECT, there is a memory, there's short-term memory loss. You can only get so many of these therapies in a lifetime. And with TMS, it's not as bad. You can get more treatments. Uh, we see that this one um, is being now used for our people who have schizophrenia. Psychosurgery is very dicey. Once you damage the brain, it's over. You're not going to be able to really glue it back together and fix it. So psychosurgery is a last resort. And remember what they cut for people who um, suffer from severe seizures is the corpus callosum. Um, but psychosurgery is irreversible. And a long time ago, they did do lobotomies. And lobotomies were where they removed the frontal lobe. But lobotomies are highly controversial, and they're not allowed in America anymore. So modern methods, they try and look at like what we know from neurosurgery, our neurobiology. And they try and make certain that people don't go back to those old ways. So when we look at preventing psychological disorders, it's better to prevent than the cure. It's easier to stop if you see the signs of something than to wait for something to happen. You know, like if you know the light's red, you're definitely going to want to slow down and stop instead of just running it. You know, if you can prevent something, then you certainly should. So preventing psychological disorders means trying to remove factors that typically could typically control or contribute to it. Sorry, things like poverty, meaningless work constant criticism, unemployment, racism, and sexism. Basically, the bad things in the society, try and get those away so that people will be psychologically healthy. Um, and remember, the biopsychosocial part is something that you need to know for each of these disorders. That is the end of Chapter 17, Psychotherapy.